Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn. Today, we're going to be doing a best of. This week, actually, we're going to be doing two best of shows. Hopefully, get back to the live content next week. I've just been a little too crushed uh, in the studio to be able to get the episodes in. But um, we've got some good ones for you. This first one we're going to be sharing with you is Joey Sturgis from Joey Sturgis Tones, one of our most popular podcasts of the last year. We thought you might like to hear it again. And maybe if you haven't heard it, you'll be hearing it for the first time. So enjoy it. Joey Sturgis from the West Barn. Hey, it's Joe West from the West Barn with Mike Shimshak. Today we have Joey Sturgis from Joey Sturgis Tones on the podcast. Excited to have him. Friend of uh, Billy Decker, of course, uh, but we've been knowing about Joey Sturgis and his plugins for a long time. It kind of burst onto the scene, which was a really cool thing I wanted to add. We both are very curious to ask you about, but uh, before we do that, we want to remind you to subscribe wherever you're listening, whether that be Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. Remember to subscribe and hit all the notifications that you need to do and tell a friend about our podcast. So without further ado, Joey Sturgis is a record producer, although when I was looking through his credits, I saw uh, composition. I saw he played keyboards on some stuff, some record production, some engineering. So he's one of those dudes that's all over all kinds of records, doing all kinds of things. A long history, mostly heavy, heavy music. Um, it had a single that was gold with uh, Asking Alexandria, the final episode, um, plus a bunch of other successful records in that genre. Uh, welcome to the show. We are glad to have you, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Um, and that's a Awesome introduction. I'll uh, I'll be taking that from you and using it elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. I have been introduced so poorly so many times, and it's mostly my own fault because of old bios that are out there. Uh, I I once was introduced at a show. I was playing uh, for a benefit, and they had these jumbotrons on the left and right, and. Out of the, my peripheral, as I before big, I see they have a picture that's not me up on the side, and it says Joe West, the Rhinestone Cowboy, which is evidently <laughs> there's a guy out there that. So someone didn't do the research, and, and here I am playing at this gala, and two 50-foot versions of some other guy called Joe West the Rhinestone Cowboy was up on the Jumbotrons. So we try to do what we can to get it right. Um, well, at least you didn't get your name printed in a CD, uh, Joey Struggus, instead of Joey Sturgis. <laughs> <laughs> I think my best uh, credit was Joe the biggest toe in the industry west because i would i would work with my shoes off and i've got these fred flintstone feet and my <laughs> big toe looks like a light bulb it's just like a, it's not an odd toe it's just you know i've got fred I, I admit it i got fred flintstone feet and um so i was credited on this particular record without them running it by me this is back when we actually had liner notes as joe the biggest toe in the business west so there you have it <laughs> hey man, you know you really fascinate me it's like you got universal plugins, you've got waves plugins, you've got everybody, multi conglomerations making plugins, and then some dude pops out of nowhere and kind of like disrupts the entire space. And like that's my perception of what you've done is is that far from the truth? I mean it feels that way. No, uh, that's that's actually like the way that it came about is pretty interesting because my friend, um, his name is Nick Sampson. He's also a producer in the metal scene. He kind of dared me to make my own plugins and he knew that I was a programmer and he knew that I was sort of into computer science and I was into like the, the science of audio more so than the creativity of audio. I like to use the science to, to accomplish the, the creative stuff, but um, I, I immediately wrote it off. I was like, no, I, there's no way I'm not, I don't have time. I'm not even going to even look at it. I'm not even going to try. And, um, a couple of weeks later, uh, I had some free time and I didn't have anything else to do. I could play video games, but I was like, no, nah, I'm going to, I'm going to read, I'm going to look up some stuff about these plugin formats or whatever. So started looking into it and actually the VST two format was pretty easy. Um, so I was like, okay, well I'll start there. And I started messing around and lo and behold, um, I had something on my computer that was processing audio and changing the way it sounded and it was pretty exciting. And I, at that moment, I had the, the realization that there's never been a producer, uh, at least up until I started, that, that I know of that started their own product, their like own plugin company. Like it was typically you already had a plugin company established they would come to a producer that maybe the producer would work with that company and they would create something together, but it was never like the producer started it. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. 
Um, and then if you compound that on top of my story, which is I grew up um, in Indiana, I uh, started making records out of a garage. I was using the bare minimum equipment. Um, I just thought that, you know, wow, this is a compelling story. You've got all this background um, of barely making records in a garage to starting a software company and, and sort of disrupting the scene as well as disrupting, disrupting the analog, uh, you know, that whole analog to in the box kind of movement. I was kind of a part of that as well. And so it just kind of all made sense. And then the real test was if I put it online, is anyone going to care? And so I made like a vocal compressor, I put it on my website and, the next day there was a ton of sales. And so that was the validation, I guess. What was that, that I, one called? That was called gain reduction. All right, dude, I bought that compressor. So in- See what in, I'm saying? <laughs> you've got, this is, this is like, this is stunning because you get to a certain point in your career and then it's like people start to give you things, right? And I've been lucky enough in the plugin world that people give me plugins. I saw a demo or a video of some dude and it was a rock thing, but the vocal, the in and out, the bypass versus the engaged version of that plugin was so extraordinary that I just went at that exact moment, went and found my wallet, which is never on me, and got a credit card out and punched in all the numbers and I bought that plugin. So that's a testament, you know, because I'm not wired that way to go find my wallet and buy something. You know, it's just like all these steps, right? So that I remember it being stunning. And I, that's surprising that that was your first plugin. But it was like, I my vision of this is like, okay, I work with the guys in Waves at Waves a lot, you know, and they've got a big building in Tel Aviv and they've got a big building in Knoxville, right? And they've got all these guys flying around the planet. What does your office look like? Is it literally like in my heart of hearts, I hope it's just you and a couple of dudes with like desks pushed together, like the beginning of that Apple photo from the very beginning in the garage. <laughs> Or are you like in a big building now that's super oh, high-tech? It's actually going to blow your mind. Um, there, Technically, there is no uh, JST office other than a spare room on the side of my house, you know? Um, and all the, all the team members that work at JST, they're all remote, so they all work in their own homes on their own computers. And I'm literally staring at my office. It's this laptop. I mean, it's... It's a whole that. new, it's like a whole new wave. Like not only did I kind of do the whole new wave of like audio production where it's like all done in a computer and you're using minimal gear, but I kind of did the same approach to business, which I didn't even realize. Like I just, you know, you're always working and you're, you're, you're trying to climb the ladder and you're trying to get to the next step, but it's just like, we never needed an office building. Cause it would be like, we found a programmer. He's already got his own cool setup. He's got his, all of his computers at his spot. Like, no need to move him. He, you know, he's comfortable where he is. Like you just kind of, as we made these steps and these advances, it just like never came up. And I was like, wow, I guess we're kind of part of that whole new, um, like remote working revolution that's happening in a lot of tech industries right now. Um, you but know, how many people can resist the urge? It's like, okay, now you've shown up. It's like, well, let's get you a big Google looking office, right? Like, uh, what's that great, um, I watched that thing on HBO, what, uh, Silicon Valley, like that whole series one funding and they get like a, a, ma a massive thing and then they have like Journey play their, their party in the backyard, you know, like <laughs> you've been able to resist that, which shows a lot of restraint in regards to just philosophy and trying to keep it really where it started, you know, like uh, it's, there's something that indie about that, that, that guys like me and Mike really like. Yeah. Uh, so that word indie that's very important because that's exactly how uh how it all that's how i began it's how this whole thing progressed and it's it's still what we fundamentally do in the end of the at the end of the day it's like you know i've got a guy um who does content marketing in jst and he'll be working on a project and he'll be like hey it's going to be a day late my dog uh like did something spilled all this stuff it's like okay cool you know whatever it's it's more laid back. It's more, um, it's, I want to say it's also a little more rock and roll. Like it, to your example about that video you saw and it made you want to literally pull out your credit card and buy that plugin. That was something that I had not seen in um, this industry. Like, you know, when w waves would make a new plugin, there wasn't a video of like a guy like 
you know, belting out some vocals into a microphone or, or yeah. something that, to demonstrate it. And so I felt like I was bringing something to the table um, in that regard where uh, it was a little more rock and roll. It was a little more edgy, a little more independent, but also came from a place of, um, I don't think that somebody who wants to be technically or s someone who wants to be creatively proficient needs to be technically proficient at the same time. So why don't we make these tools instead of having threshold ratio, attack, release, all these things that you have to understand. Why don't we just like name the knobs, how musicians talk like musicians right. will be like, Hey man, like put some more heat on those uh, guitars. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. But we all, we all kind of understand that, that sort of unwritten language. And so, I wanted to put it into plugins, and that's where um, I got the idea. Do you remember back uh, there was a couple of years ago? I was developing a signature plugin with Waves, and we were talking about that exact thing, which was like, you know, let's make it so that people can, people's mothers eventually can make records. You know, there was, and we kept referring. I kept referring to that one DBX plugin, and it was a half rack space. It was a compressor, and it was like it had one slider that said more as it was going do you remember this compressor i do i remember it, it was freaking awesome you go in and i just like and it was from an era of like in new york city where it was just gear after gear menu after menu you go into those sony r7s and you'd just be in on a, looking at a screen like this for an hour and a half going through pre-delay times and room time mids times and this thing was it was just this dbx compressor that had a, all these red really great little dbx 160s kind of soft knee lights going across and in one slider and it just was more and i was like there was something about that even way back then that i was like i want the i want more of this you know it's like you shouldn't have to have on a white lab coat to mix a record you should put it into people's hands that that truly can create give them the opportunity to be create creative without having to be scientists yeah, and what's cool about it too is once you've created something like that, I'm sure there was a, sort of a talk of the town kind of thing going on where, you know, guys are like, hey, did you get that new DBX compressor that's got that one slider that just says more on it? It's like, yeah, what's that thing doing? I don't know. I'm going to open it up and see what's going on inside. Yeah. You get this cool like um, conversation going. And, and what ultimately we figured out is that the most important part of your campaign is to get people talking. And so, uh, especially with social media now, now that social media sort of drives everything, you want to create a, a dialogue, a conversation about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so that has been our biggest focus on our products is to, to be solution focused. So like, what is the problem uh, or sorry, what is the product solving? What problem is the product solving and why, uh, what was the story behind the inspiration? Um, you know, why did you make it? And I think that is just, just, actually more important than the um, the technicals, really. When I looked at your website this morning, I was browsing through all the pages of plugins. And on my phone, there were seven pages. So you can imagine, you know, it's a pretty good collection of individual plugins as well as package plugins and producer packs. But what I did notice was that they were very specific. Um, and I can't remember but I think there was one just for Tom's if I was, you know, like the Tominator or something, you know, like there were yeah. things where it was like, Hey, this is a solution to this thing. You want Tom's that are pingy. You want Tom's that are fat. This is the plugin to do that versus like, Oh, you're going to need two EQs. You're going to need an OV easy, easy compressor. You're going to need a fat limiter on top. It, like take that part of it out of it. Right. And give a person like a solution that looks like, Oh, this is what I'm thinking. Let's remove all of the math behind it and give them something that will do what they want them to, want it to do. It's a brilliant idea when you think of it. Are you doing all the coding still, Joey? Uh, no. The only product that I coded myself was gain reduction, and then um, that was sort of proof of concept. So once once I knew that people were interested in getting software from me and my brand, uh, reached out to some different developers to get some help and. You know, since then we've gone through you know three or four different um, uh, programmers, and now we've got a guy that we're you know we've been using for the last couple of years that has really taken um, our software to the next level, and um, he we, he's grown along with us just as much as we've grown with him, and now we're starting to use machine learning and artificial intelligence and all those kinds of things, and so. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry about the dog. <laughs> It's your um, Google alert. You got a new email? Yeah. 
Um, but you know, now we're able to, uh, pretty much tackle any kind of problem. And, um, so we're now sourcing a lot of our ideas from our community because we've grown and had enough people interested in our stuff that they're constantly communicating like, Hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? I get DMS every, every single day with somebody who has a plugin idea. Um, so it's, it's interesting to sort of now, um, be the provider of this community rather than, uh, when I started creating plugins, they were just to solve my own problems, kind of like the Tominator thing. It's like, you know, what's really annoying is when uh, you hit a Tom and then you hit a symbol like right afterwards and it like makes this really weird, like high frequency schmear kind of thing going on. It's like, I would go in and take an aut automation tool and like use a, a, a low pass filter and like manually make it go like this every single time the Tom oh hit. And I was like, man, well, can we just create like a, a like a plugin that does this for us so that I don't have to go in and manually do all these automation moves? And uh, so I talked to my programmer, he starts coding it up and I start using it in my session and I'm like, this is amazing. I'm so glad that I have this now. And then I just put it on my website and other people uh, find it useful as well. Let's say you actually have an idea like, hey, I wanna have, uh, maybe tell us about the very first one you did and what the process looks like now, but like you from conception to applied plugin, talk about the very first one you did and how long it took in maybe your pathway and talk about like current day. Like if I had an idea and me and Mike say, Hey, we want to do this and we give you a plugin, then how long would it take you to make that an actual plugin that you could put in a folder? So what we'll typically start out with is we'll actually try to create um, the plugin in some sort of format or fashion in a DAW. So like using, you know, existing plugins like stock plugins or automation methods or whatever it, sort of the idea is we try to kind of like do it in a DAW to where we can see like what this is going to sound like and we can kind of test it before we ever even like touch code. And then what we'll do with the code is we'll do like really, really rapid development. So something that's like, you could do this in like uh, Reaper, for example, they have their own scripting language where you can actually just program like really basic um, uh, DSP uh, sort of algorithms and things like that to kind of like test out ideas. And then from there, we'll go to a prototype this whole timeline is probably around three to four weeks. And then, then we kind of, what we'll do is we'll like sit on it for a while because we, we want to really create ideas that are going to last a long time. So once we have a prototype, we start using it in our sessions. We start giving it to friends. We start experimenting with it um, to see if it's really an idea that's going to fly. And if it does, then we go into um, the whole UI and GUI and uh, revision iter you know, iterations and things like that until we get to that final process. And so to answer your final question, like how long does it end up, it does it take to end up like in your DAW working? Sometimes it, it depends. Um, for example, the Toneforge Ben Bruce plugin that we did, we Ben Bruce and I were so specific about the kind of guitar tone that we wanted to create. That plugin um, from inception to final product took about 45 days. But then there's some products that we've done that take like two years because you know, after messing with it for a year, we get like a new idea and then we, it totally mangles the whole thing and we kind of have to restructure it and then we have to go back and redo art assets. And, and since we render things in 3d, we have to like re-render them. And it's like all this stuff that just kind of can mess up uh, the timeline. But in the interest of making like something that stands the test of time, um, that's really sort of the necessary rabbit hole you have to go, go down. But let's say if everything was, it, before you do R and D and figure it out, but like to get your concept from like, Hey, we want to build something that does this to getting a working version of it. How fast is it possible to do that? Well now, I mean, you have tools like juice, which is uh, an SDK, which it's one of the best um, out there for audio plugins. And I think it's what most people are using. You can do it in like days. Uh, it's really not, it's, it's pretty trivial to be honest. Like, but then the, there's a lot of other work that makes it, you know, that pivots it left to right or decides viability. Exactly. And then... Exactly. So the, the trivial part is, is it's just like you type code, you compile it, it works. So that's all easy and super straightforward. It's, it's all the other stuff, right. um, you know, that can make it take forever. And how, like, well, let's say you send it out to a crew of guys that you have that are just testing this like weird looking GUI that doesn't have a GUI, just like this, this very rudimentary version of the plugin. Like, are you looking for it to crash? Are you looking for just like the mentality of like, oh, this, I get it, but it, I, I wouldn't use this. Or like, what do, what happens during that R&D part of it? 
I am really looking for um, opinions and I want to leverage other people's ears because I think the most important part of producing and, and being creative with audio is the ears. It's not the gear. That's kind of like our, one of our catchphrases, I guess you could say. Um, and so what I'm looking for is, do I get some, someone writing me an email back that says like, Hey, yeah, check it out. It looks pretty cool. Or yo dude, what is this doing? It sounds crazy. I like, you got to tell me what's going on in there. When I, when someone says that to me, I know that we're doing something right. Cause you know, after you need that to market it, you need that level of excitement about it. Exactly. So your first plugin, when you sat down to do gain reduction, uh, from the minute you sat down to the minute that you had a version that was that would have been considered version one, which I probably have. It's probably the one I, I probably have like the one that actually has wires inside of it. The only one, right? So tell me how long did that take you to get that to a, a version that was actually representative of that plugin? Well, when I started out, I was experimenting and I, I didn't really uh, fully understand electrical engineering or, and I still don't, but um, I didn't really understand like how, you know, what's the difference between like a, a, a FET compressor versus a opto or like all these, you know, all the different variations of compression, right? Um, so I kind of don't really know. It, it's almost like being a chef in a kitchen and you have like, you're surrounded by all these ingredients and these tools and you just start grabbing stuff and you're not really sure if you're really peeling the carrot properly or not, but you're just using something that scrapes the sides of it and whatnot. That's kind of how it was for me. I was like just a, a, a producer. I understood some of the science, um, but not all of it. And so I was just kind of experimenting and trying to figure it out. So it, it really was this process of like just messing around with it for two months. Like I was, I was working on actual albums and I was still using uh, the tools that I would use, the processes that I use. But every once in a while, I would open a main vocal track and, and process it through my, my little science experiment. And I'd be like, wow, I actually like how I can hear like more teeth in this one, or I can hear more throat in this one. And so I actually started like leaving it in some of the mixes. And then I would send them over to like the artist and the label and people would be like, yeah, this sounds great, man. And I'm like, wow, there's like some serious validation going on here. And it just, the confidence that I was getting from like, I wasn't telling anyone that I was running um, their vocals through my plugin, but they were hearing it and it basically passing the blind test, right? Like yeah. they're listening to it and going, whoa, this, my vocals have never sounded better. And I'm like, ha ha ha, I know exactly why. And it, you know, so it was kind of this cool thing. That and was that happening. compressor does that. That is a bizarre compressor. Like when you move the gain reduction to more, it is literally, it, it, that's a great adjective you use. It, it has teeth, you know, it turns into this, like, it's almost like a transition to the, to the wolf man. You know, it's like the personality of the vocalist, the same track actually changes, which is like, wow, how'd they do that? You know, it's, it's a really cool thing. So let's say you had it working as a compressor within a several days, right? But when you started using it, like, what were you doing to give it more teeth? Is that one of the changes along the way? Like, were you like saying, oh, I'm going to go ahead and tweak it. And now it's this iteration, version 2.0 of it. Yeah. So, you know, there's definitely some secrets in there. But um, one thing I can give away is that the knee shape is actually one of the most important reasons why it's so much different than a lot of other um, compressors out there because uh, I didn't create the knee shape with any sort of visual, like I didn't have any kind of visual adjustment to create that knee shape. It's all just sort of like numbers and math. And so it looks pretty freaky and weird, um, but it ends up sounding pretty good. And it, it's really the reason why is that you typically in a, in a vocal, um, and, and this is kind of my opinion, I, you really kind of want it to just like be in this, in this like small little box, it's just like riding on top of the, uh, of the mix. And it kind of never really deviates too much, but it does deviate a little bit. And, um, I like it to be pretty aggressive. Like I want to hear the, 
like the bottom of the vocal and the top of the vocal. I just want to hear all of it like right there, you know? Right. And so the knee shape helps achieve that. Um, and for, But it also allows it to bump up above that spot every once in a while. So for people who don't know, and you can, you correct me if I'm wrong here. All right. So there's two kinds of, the knee shape is the way when you set a compressor, the way that once it crosses the threshold and it starts to do the compression, it needs to make a decision on how to introduce its settings into that, into that compressor. So if you have the attack and release time set and ratio set and all these things set, the whenever it engages that vocal and it says, oh, it just crossed the threshold, I gotta go do my job, it's gonna do that via the knee. It's how it approaches it. It can have a hard knee, which is set to whatever your ratio is. So if your ratio is four to one, it's gonna go right up to 41 and start to work at four to one and it's gonna approach it with whatever knee. That's, the, that's sort of the visual representation of how it goes into the wave. What I've been told is that soft knee compressors like the DBX160 and any compressor that would be a soft knee, uh, is it uses the ratio. So it will start like a fishing rod at zero to zero and it will, un, it will unfurl itself like a fishing rod and it will raise that ratio. So soft knee does not go straight to a ratio like four to one or 10 to one or 20 to one. It will let you unwheel from zero to zero to all the way one to one, two to one to two, one to three, one to four, or I'm sorry, four to one, five to one, six to one to whatever your ratio is. Is that correct? Am I, am I explaining this correct? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you, you know, you have sort of like S curves for, for knee shapes. You have uh, linear, uh, you have like, there's all kinds of different shapes. Um, and so, you know, you could almost have like a, like a, a ramp up and then there's like a stopping point and then another ramp, or you can have like a, a ramp, ramp, ramp. Uh, you can have obviously the S you, you, and uh, so there's a lot of these different things that you can experiment with because it's just, you're not just experimenting with like attack release ratio threshold. You're experimenting right. with uh, like, how does it get to that point? How much time does it take? What does that journey look like? And I, this is all getting to that geek speak stuff. But um, if you really want to like do something different, uh, you you got to play around with those things because those are the things that I feel like kind of make it um, have that mojo. And compressors uh, are so hard to understand anyhow for most people, right? The idea of just ratio blow, the people can't seem to grasp the idea of ratio, you know, and they can't seem to grasp like, and then they'll see a compressor that has like a hold knob on it, not even, the, which is different than release. And it's, people literally want to, they, they don't under, they comp, can't comprehend it. That's why compressors, and it's good to know all that about a compressor, because the more you know it, the more you see it in a 3D space, and then you can manipulate it and make it do things that maybe wasn't even intended to do, right? It's like a tool. Uh, but there's a whole version of this where it's like, let's take that out of the responsibility of a creator. Like, watch somebody who's a really gifted songwriter and rec and producer who knows what he wants to hear. Why should he have to know about soft knee and zigzag over knees that go over and curve back down? You know, and there's a whole movement in pro audio, which is like the people that are the nerds in the, I won't call them nerds, but the elite that think that you're less of a person because you don't understand the difference between hard and soft knee and the variance of those knees. And then there's somebody that's like, well, let's give people the tools. Do you find that people, do you find that there's a contingency that doesn't like your plugins because they're taking the engineering out of it? Oh, for sure. Um, that's one of the most critical uh, pieces of feedback that we get. Um, it actually has been one of the things that makes it difficult to grow as a company because um, there's a there's an interesting phenomenon that happens when you price your plugins even. So like if you take a plugin and let's say I price it at $199, all of a sudden I get uh, head turns from all of the pro audio people because now they look at this and they say, oh, it's uh, $199. It must be doing something really special. Um, and you could price it at 49 and then those guys look the other way. They just don't even care. Um, so you have that happening. And then you also have the idea that, uh, like you said, producers are looking at it and go, Oh, well this just simplifies the craft. So, you know, why would I be interested in that? Like I want to be, um, this sort of ninja of audio and I totally get both sides of the, that coin. And I think that at the end of the day, like, we want to empower the next generation of musical creators. And I really believe in, in, in the, 
those people being more more than just um, wizards of audio. I, I look at them more as like entertainers. Um, I'm talking about like YouTubers and like people who create music, not just because they want to be a music creator, but it, because it's like a part of their whole thing. Like look at like people like Jared Dines, where he's a comedian. He he's an entertainer. He also has a band. Uh, he makes songs. He makes parodies. He does covers. There's a lot of reasons why Jared Dines is making music, and I want him to use my tools. I, I you know, it'd be nice if, uh, you know, I can get like some of the industry's best people, like Chris Lordalgy, using gain reduction, which, by the way, he does use. Um, but I find it even more interesting that you get the next generation of people using these tools and then they're not even thinking twice because their their mindset is how do I create something that my audience is going to love so they're not even interested in the idea of becoming like a, a compressor expert and that's really what has driven me to like take this thing further and further along because I realized that I'm not just helping like you know, some dude that wakes up every morning and makes records for a living. Like I'm helping people like create their own empire, their own businesses, their own, um, you know, creative uh, inventory, so to speak. And I, I find that pretty interesting. And are you still able to do records? I mean, I can't imagine you can Actually, sit in the studio um, making records. Because like a lot of people thought that I sort of stopped uh, making records and I kind of did take a break from that. Um, but I never fully stopped. So um, for those who don't know, my wife is in a band and they're called Conquer Divide and I've been producing all of their stuff. So that's never stopped. And I'm actually working with some pretty exciting uh, projects that I can't talk about right now, but they're all going to come out over the next year. And um, so short answer, yeah, I'm, I'm still making records. i still running this company, still making records. And it's kind of my... Uh, my full time life, you know, I, I don't really have like work life separation. It's just kind of all blended together. Yeah. I bet. I mean, I can't imagine how busy you are. I mean, when you talk about the way the company's structured and how it seems like all the funnels lead down to you in regards to making decisions, right? So to be able to be in the studio cutting a vocal and need the focus that you would have to spend with that vocalist and then have your phone buzzing every five minutes about a GUI 3d decision or, you know, that's exactly how it is. Uh, I literally will be comping a vocal and then approving a, a knob like at the same time. So it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> so how did you find Billy Decker? I mean, it's not he's so far out of genre with what you guys, your brand is over there. And we had him on the podcast. And, and I got to tell you, it was one of the funnest. I knew of Billy and we chatted a couple times. And, but when we, we really got to spend some quality time on air on the podcast. And he was he's got to be the, one of the funniest dudes he's I've ever incredible. spent an hour with. He's incredible. Oh, Billy like, how, tell like, me how you, tell me your Billy Decker story. For sure. Um, for one, I will say Billy is one of the best humans I know. Um, and I'm very grateful to call him a friend, but the way that we got introduced is actually a really great story. So, uh, we have this, uh, education platform. It's called unstoppable recording machine. And one of the services in there, is called Nail the Mix, which is this site where you join, you sign up, you pay monthly, and you learn how to mix from your favorite mixing engineers. You, you get to watch them live stream their mixing process from beginning to end, and we do a different uh, mixer and a different song every single month. And we found out um, that Billy was subscribed to Nail the Mix, and he's a country mixer, as most people know him. And uh, he was asking us a question. I think he was writing into, because um, we had it to where you could like email you know, me or Joel or Al, those are the guys that, you know, we all started this thing and we had it for a while where you could just like email us questions. And he was talking about something to do with the kick drum. And, uh, and we were like, what the heck? Like Billy Decker subscribed to nail the mix. And at that time we had only had metal on like the first year or two of nail the mix was like nothing but metal. Like we were just, that's all we knew. And that's all we did. And we we're like, why does it Billy Decker want to learn how to mix metal? And, and so, we immediately uh, canceled his account and gave him like a free lifetime subscription. Uh, we're like, why are you paying us for this, man? And uh, he's like, no, 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 I insist. I want to pay. I want to I want to contribute. And, and then we just got to talking. And he was such a cool guy that it was just like, 
hey, let's let's uh, you know we're we've been talking about experimenting with other genres. Let's take a uh, a risk on Billy and see how country does. And um, and we were very scared because we thought that it would be a horrible month um, because we just had so many like metal uh, oriented customers and everything. But they actually ended up loving it. It's 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 one of their favorite months. And and Billy did some cool stuff where he mixed country. And then he showed how his country mixing process could be applied to metal and he mixed a metal song and he did all this cool stuff that we'd never done on Nail the Mix before. Um, and the the cool part about it was that we were able to, you know, fortunately uh, times were different back then. So we were able to travel to a studio, hang out with him for like three or four days. And he showed us around Nashville and we just did all this cool stuff and it was all baked into doing the show with him. And that's how the friendship began. But yeah, uh, I can't tell you how many times, like I'll go to a concert and I'll meet someone and they'll tell me that they're subscribed to nail the mix. And I'm like, this is blowing my mind. Like people that I like literally are watching, you know, on stage perform in front of 20,000 people is like a subs one of those guys on that stage is like subscribed to my, my mixing education thing. So, uh, it's actually been a really awesome way to meet people, uh, which is very strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's just a, he, he's just, he's transparent. And I think the people appreciate that. And I think he's considerate enough to say like, oh, this is what I do all day, every day. And, and, but check it out. It works. He has enough consideration to say, these are what these folks are interested in. I'm going to show them how it transitions into the metal world. And I think they see that as a sign of respect and, and, um, you know, and appreciate him for that. He's such a, he's such a great guy. He's a great lit litmus test too. And Mike's like this. If people don't like Mike Shimshack, I know that I shouldn't be friends with him. You know, and if people don't like Billy Decker, you probably should question whether they're good human beings or not. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And, and if you can't have a good time with Billy, uh, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> right. There's something wrong with you. Yeah. You need to be sent back. You know, it's like the 1% of all gear that gets sent back to the manufacturer. You need to get sent back to the manufacturer and get tweaked. Yeah. That's awesome, dude. Uh, so you're, you tell us, you tell us this is your lake house, which is another indication that Joey Sturgis tones is doing good. When you look at the big guys in your, in your field, you know, when you look at universal audio and waves, I would guess they're the two. Is there anyone else that's up there like controlling that market? Those well, are the two big ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. You've got waves, you've got universal audio. Um, you know, you even have, um, you know, slate for example. Slate. Yeah. I forgot about slate. So and he's a, he's one. another individual that's done this. Like, can you tell us like what market share looks like in that? And it's like how much you, which is just a normal dude like us showed up and now you're competing with universal audio in waves and Slate, you know, I mean, but Slate's an individual too. Like, what's the market share look like on, on a giant scale of like how, how many plugins are sold? How much of that market share are you able to eat into? Well, you know, I look at it as like, it's kind of hard to figure out what this market really is um, because you could almost separate it into little segments. You know, you could have your, your pro audio, you've got your pro consumers, you've got your people like Dan Corneff who are like absolutely professional and have platinum records. Right. So who are you really selling to? And, um, I'll tell you, I don't really have like a great answer, but I can tell you like sort of the story. And the story is I was a producer working on these independent record label um, projects with bands that were mostly 18 years old or younger even sometimes. And they're coming into my studio. It's the first time they've ever recorded anything in their life. It's the first time they've like they're getting signed by this you know Rise Records and they're getting this big advance and it's like kind of a crazy thing that was happening during this time period. And this is a lot of like the metalcore genre stuff. And what I noticed, and it was pissing me off when I first noticed it, but then I had to I had to do what you do and in the music industry when you get pissed off about something, you just got to find a new way to look at it and you got to go with the flow, right? That's that's just how it works in music. Um, everyone can listen to your songs for free. So instead of getting pissed off about not being able to sell your music, you just find a way to, to de deal with it or to use it to your advantage, right? So I'm getting pissed off because I'm working with these, these bands and in my head, I'm thinking, you're supposed to be an artist. You're supposed to be in here worried about your songs, but instead you're asking me all these questions about recording. And I noticed that there was more and more interest in the recording part and the recording part. And it got to the point where there was bands coming in and they would bring like their laptops and they would go in their bedrooms when it wasn't their turn to record. Like I'm recording the drummer or something. Um, 
they go into the bedroom and record more stuff. And then they'll ask like what kind of plugins I'm using and, and how I'm doing this and how I'm doing that. And I was like, Hey, like, you know, what's going on here? I don't want to give you all my secrets and you're supposed to be the, the band. Right. So, but, um, I realized, okay, well, this is something that I obviously am not going to be able to stop. Um, and why would I, it's, I guess, you know, I've changed my perspective a lot over the years. I actually think it's really cool now that people are doing this. So I, I really love it. But back then I did not And, um, so I was like, how could I get involved in this? Like, what are some different ways? And the first way I began was with drum samples because no one knew how to mix drums and it took me forever to figure it out. And when you make a drum sample, you can sort of capture a drum mix and, and make it reusable for other people if you're, if you know what you're doing with samples. And so that's how I started. And I realized there's a market for this because I don't have Dan Corneff or Chris Lord Algy coming to my store, but I've got the guitar player of Bless the Fall and the vocalist of this band and the drummer of that band. Like I just realized what you're saying, which is like there's a whole – the market is not a capped market. It's, it's infinite if you look towards the creatives rather than just like trying to get Bob Clearmountain to use your plugin, right? Exactly. And so when I saw the window of opportunity, I saw, okay, here I am – not really a professional. I'm just a guy in a garage making records and they're doing well. So that's cool. And I've got these people who actually trust me and like what my stuff sounds like. And then I've got this sea of people in the internet all asking me, how do you get your guitar tones? What are you doing to your vocals? Blah, blah, blah. I just saw myself in a position where I was like, I guess I'm a self-appointed expert here uh, in, a, in a sense that the community really wants me to to speak on this stuff and to provide this stuff. And so I just started creating it and started sharing it. And I think um, I saw, you know, YouTube starting to explode and I saw people become entertainers and make, you know, you really think about it, It's like, if you're making a YouTube video, there's, there's a, there's audio. So there's a whole audio production happening underneath of that video. Who's doing it? Who's mixing it? Who's editing it? How is it being made? What plugins are being used? Blah, 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 blah. And so it just kind of naturally evolved into that. And, and um, luckily, and you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. but I was just playing around with social media. I didn't realize how important it was that I was building a, an audience and a community at that time. You know, I was one of the first people on MySpace, one of the first people on Twitter, uh, one of the first people to have a Gmail account. Like, I, I just really kind of went along with the whole internet and social media growth and always I, like I, I was making uh, studio update videos on my YouTube channel back in 2006. So I was creating that curiosity and building that audience the whole time. And I'm so glad I did because then when, when it came time to actually release a product, there was already a market there that I essentially sort of carved out myself um, through making these records. Dude, I love the story. I love that you were like not that different than me or Mike and that you don't, you haven't like taken, since you've gotten the leap, it hasn't like you've, you haven't turned into the series one funding dude and forgotten the roots. You still seem like you could be in a control room with me and Mike making records. And I think that's like, I think that's commendable because that's, you know, that's what people, you have to be believable and I, I believe you. It's relatable. What's that, Mikey? relatable yeah and it isn't like once he got the hype that he then abused it and became this ugly version of himself right that didn't remember the garages you were working in and the people who use your plugins and it's like i really can respect that and i think the people sense that about you so that's a really i don't really even know you know i mean it's just a really cool thing to see uh as an artist and a record producer and a songwriter i'm always on searching for authenticity for the realness in something. And then when I see it in people, it's just my, my spider senses go off. And they go off the other way too, where it's like a lot of times we'll have people on the podcast and it's like, I just don't believe them. You know, or there's something about somebody I meet on in a session where I just feel like this is sketchy. This is something going on here where it's got my spider senses going in the wrong way. But uh, you've got it pinging all in the right way. And I think that all your people I would imagine you've got an army of believers behind you, you know, so congratulations on all that. Uh, can you give us some, some links where uh, obviously Joey Sturgis tones.com. Is that it? What's the website? Yeah. Joey Sturgis tones. By the way, thanks. Thank you for that observation. And, and one thing I'll say about that is 
um, I'm still that guy, man. Like, you know, I posted a photo on Instagram. I think it was probably like last month um, when I was working on my wife's record and we made like this vocal tent out of like these blankets that my wife still has from when she was like in grade school or something. And, <laughs> like, you know, it's just, it's all down to earth and, and we make our records in our homes. Like we're not, you know, it's, it, we're simple people. We like to be creative and, um, dude, that's got, a great point. Every plugin or not every plugin, every dream is sold behind a hundred input console that never gets used anymore. Oh, it's, it's like, I have friends that tell me it's the biggest drink coaster. Um, the most expensive drink coaster they've ever purchased. Yeah. But it is that, you know, everybody's Facebook picture behind the hundred input console at ocean way versus the reality of the 99.9999% of the records are going to be made under the blankets with a microphone, with a snake coming under the, the garden door, you know, into the great room where you're mixing it. Um, and I think it's cool that people are embracing that. And, and you're the, the tip of that spear rather than this, frosted Instagram perspective of recording and making records. It's, it's so cool. Yeah. I love to see that. Uh, and I think it's, there's no, no wonder why you're so successful. And you know, to be on the radar, when you think of companies that are so big that they've got multiple buildings in multiple countries in big addresses and hundreds of people working for them. And then you got this dude showing up. I love the idea of that. You know, it just like, it makes me feel like I'm watching Rudy or, you know, any, you know, Rocky, <laughs> Rocky, any great comeback story or great underdog story. Uh, there's something really cool about that because I think as creators, we all identify with you. We say, that's who I am. You know, that's the face of, of who I am as a creator. So any other websites or Instagram or anything you want to point us towards? Yeah, man. Um, just check out what we're doing. I think what we're doing is pretty cool. It's all community driven. We're really... Okay. Love to do that. So joeysturgistones.com. Um, you can actually find us on Facebook as well. We have a Facebook forum. Um, it's called the, the Joey Sturgis Tones uh, Forum. And then we also have uh, Nail the Mix, which is like, like it's one thing to be a member of Nail the Mix and, and um, learn how to mix, but the community part of it is really the coolest thing that we have going for us. So if you want to hang out with, with fellow nerds, people who love to just like geek out on recording and audio production, like join Nail the Mix. I, I think the price is worth it just for the, the community, but you're going to get access to like all the, the education stuff as well, which is super cool. So, and I'm sure you have out. a YouTube channel. We'll find all that stuff. And um, if you've got something that you haven't mentioned here, I'll research all this and get it down in the description so it's clickable. You're going to have like yours is going to be extra long from our yeah, normal you'll have the 16 different urls yeah but we'll try to find like i'll try to post that form you know the facebook form and all that so we'll find all that and post it uh thank you so much man for coming on we appreciate you yeah thank you guys this has been a really fun conversation and it's been nice to kind of get to know you guys a little bit and hopefully when uh when things wrap up we can um we can go meet each other in person or dude something. come to nashville hang out with yeah. billy decker and you guys come down we'll, we'll hang at the barn and we'll have yeah. a good old time love it love it well, awesome. Uh, that's it for us this week uh, for the West Barn. We're signing off. Thank you so much.